This lecture will have, with apologies, some mathematical content, but I'm going to try to do everything from first principles so that you will have ample time to absorb. Uh, I mean for this to be more of a conversation than a one-way lecture, so I have not prepared 110 slides. <laughs> I prepared only a handful, and I'm hoping that you will stop and ask me questions so that you're able to stay with me in the course uh, of the lecture. So as I said, the goal of this lecture is to review a few basic plasma concepts. Uh, in kinetic theory, that underlie the lectures later in this week. And I mentioned Professor Chandran's lecture, but there will be others as well. This particular subject isn't covered uh, with attention to basics as some other things are in the heliophysics textbooks. So I had to really prepare a special lecture for this, which uh, I extracted mostly out of textbooks there's an excellent one by Dwight Nicholson. If you search the web, you may still uh, find a copy or so of it, maybe a used copy. I highly recommend it to you. Uh, Professor Nicholson passed away um, at the University of Iowa some years ago, tragically, uh, as some of you may recall. I don't know whether you are old enough to recall it, but. Uh, it was an irate graduate student who shot his thesis advisor, and it was a terrible incident in the life of plasma physics and space theory, certainly. Then there's also, but so he didn't get a chance to write a second edition of his book, which I'm sure if he were around, he would. It was a very popular textbook. Then uh, there's a very nice book by Goldston and Rutherford as well. Uh, that I recommend to you, and by Boyd and Sanderson. All of these are fairly standard textbooks. The book that I'm most familiar with is one by Don Garnett and myself. Uh, Nick has a rather used copy of it lying somewhere on the table, which is a first edition, and now the second edition is available. And so most of the material that I'm going to talk about is actually taken from that book. Uh, so let me begin uh, from the beginning, that when you're looking at plasma, which is an ensemble of charged particles, a property that distinguishes plasma is that it's capable of displaying collective interactions. That's the most salient property of a plasma. It's much more than the sum of the parts much more than a collection of charged particles. And there are different levels of description for such a plasma. You can, at the simplest level, think of it as single particle motion, where you prescribe the electric and magnetic fields and see what happens. This is an exercise in Newton's second law of motion you write down MA, and on the right-hand side, you put the force. And the force turns out to be a combination of electric and magnetic forces. But these fields are prescribed and not changed in this single particle description. That's one level. Then comes a second level, whereby you begin to think of the plasma as a fluid. Uh, capable of displaying collective behavior. Neutral fluids are known to you. Water, ocean. They are also made up of molecules, but you know when you look at an ocean surface, it's capable of sustaining an enormous range of dynamics, like waves and so on and so forth, that is describable by fluid equations. So you can, in fact, write down such fluid equations for plasmas. And yesterday, when Professor Chandran asked uh, how many people uh, knew about MHD, about half of the hands went up. 
So many of you already know of a fluid model that works rather well for plasmas, the MHT model, which has the motion of the plasma as a fluid moving under the influence of electric and magnetic forces. Um, in the context of MHT, they're referred to as Lorentz forces or as the forces derived from thermal pressure. And you know these equations, at least half of you do. But there is a difference between single particle motion and fluid motion in that the electric and magnetic fields that sit in the fluid equations are not held fixed. They too evolve in space and time. So the way the, this thing happens, you start out with the plasma, certain initial state, and you let the plasma evolve. As the fluid particles move, they change the currents and the magnetic fields embedded in the system, which then act back on the fluid particles and change them. So there is a cycle here of going back and forth between the fluid motions and how they alter the electric and magnetic fields embedded in them. The word self-consistency means that, that you don't just prescribe electric and magnetic fields and hold them fixed, but you allow the charged particle motion as it changes the electric and magnetic fields to act back on the motion itself, and it's sort of a self-consistent loop. The description of the charged particles themselves is governed by Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism. And as you know, Max Maxwell's equations are linear equations in electric and magnetic fields. Curl E equals minus del B del T linear E, linear B. This is very well known to you from your undergraduate courses in electromagnetic theory. What, what then, if Maxwell's equations are so linear, makes plasma physics nonlinear? Want to take a stab at that question? Suppose you think of Maxwell's equations, right? E and B are always linear. But yet you hear that plasma physics, the study of space plasmas, laboratory plasmas, is essentially a set of nonlinear equations. What makes Maxwell's equations nonlinear as applied to plasmas? Right, that's one answer. There are sources in Maxwell's equations, charge density, current density, these depend on the motions of the plasma in a complicated nonlinear way. And had that not been so, a lot of problems in plasma physics would be solved by now. So what makes the interface between Maxwell's equations and plasma models difficult is that the source terms in Maxwell's equations depend nonlinearly on plasma things. And this we will make very clear. I mentioned this difficulty right at the outset, even when we are talking about plasmas as fluids. But this carries over to plasmas as kinetic fluids as well. So when you are dealing with fluid equations such as MHT, you're operating in configuration space, three spatial coordinates, and time. Right? That's all the domain of MHT equations. And Maxwell's equations, too, they depend on space and time. Now we go to yet another higher level of description, which is the kinetic description. And now we are looking at keeping track of particles in a plasma, which is made up of many of them millions, billions, depending on your system. And we are getting to a very detailed level of description. Now the space we move in has six dimensions. You need three spatial coordinates, 
and three velocity coordinates for each plasma particle. So if I actually draw a picture on the board, if I tell you that you have an agglomeration of dark particles, and of course I cannot draw six dimensions well, which is called gamma space, which we won't go into. Uh, and now what we are doing is to track the motion of that cloud as it moves in electromagnetic fields. Now think of the electromagnetic fields. You start out with a certain E field and a certain B field, which act on these charged particles and make them move. Movement of charged particles corresponds to current density. Current density by Maxwell produces magnetic field. So if you had a magnetic field that you started out with, the motion of the particles is going to change that. That then is going to act back on the particles again. On and on you go. Also again, the measure of self-consistency whereby electric and magnetic fields are tightly interrelated to the motion of the particles, and a fully self-consistent model keeps track of all of it and solves the problem. That is the scope of kinetic theory. And what makes plasma physics extremely interesting is that both levels two and three, if not one in some cases, are full of unsolved open questions some of which you are hearing about in the summer school. What I'm going to do next is to start at the first level, and I'll review some single particle orbits uh, for you. This is very elementary, I realize, but it's a good build-up to what we want to do eventually in this lecture on kinetic theory. Are you all with me so far? Totally clear? OK. So let's start with single particle orbit theory. We are going to deal with non-relativistic plasmas. This does not encompass a lot of important applications in um, astrophysics, for example. And all of you who have been following, even as an amateur, all the developments that are going on in astrophysics, the discovery of gravitational waves from the collision of black holes, neutron stars. Those environments are very different than the environments in many heliophysical systems. In fact, those are, in extreme state, very high magnetic fields, very high velocities, relativistic. You have things like pair plasmas, which are made up of electrons and positrons that are copiously produced. If you want to discuss the three levels of description that I went through in the context of such plasmas, you would have to go into the relativistic regime. And so you would do single particle orbits relativistically. You would do a generalization of MHD, which is both relativistic 
and also includes the corrections due to general relativity, sometimes referred to as GRMHT. Uh, the landscape is vast and exciting, and there's a lot going on there that I won't be able to cover in today's lecture, but suffice it to say, you will have a sense of the problems we are after, and believe it or not, these problems show up again as unsolved problems in the astrophysical literature of today. And if I may make this statement, plasma astrophysics as a field, therefore is a growing field, a field to which heliophysicists contributed mightily because they focused on the star that they know best, the sun, and the planets that can be visited by in situ satellites. So heliophysics as a field which inspired summer schools like this, has many of the basic ingredients that are also very, very pertinent now in some of these very exciting discoveries that are happening in plasma astrophysics. I said all that to justify why I'm using the non-relativistic equations. I took from the momentum term on the left-hand side d d t of m v I pulled out m and brought it outside, assuming m is independent of v that 's an assumption that makes that equation essentially valid for non relativistic systems and on the right hand side, you have charge particle charge q and e plus v cross b well known to all of you as the Lorentz equation right now, in an understanding of this problem uh, because you want to look at complicated electric and magnetic fields, and I'll deal with a few of these very basic orbits. A particularly useful concept is that of the guiding center. And what happens is if you have a straight magnetic field and you have charged particles that go around them, the center sits on the magnetic field around which the spiraling motion occurs. There is no charged particle at that center it is called the guiding center because it actually keeps track to the extent of a Lama radius where the charged particle is with respect to the magnetic field. So oftentimes people talk about the motion of that guiding center as reflecting off the motion of the charged particle itself. It is as if, like beads in a wire, if you keep track of the bead that is strung to the wire, you know what the history is. How many of you know all the single particle orbit drifts in electric and magnetic fields? Many fewer than MHT people who know MHT. That's very interesting to me. Are you sure or are you being shy? How many of you have had a basic course in plasma physics? Great, and you did that there are many more hands up without somebody telling you what the drifts are. That's interesting, because this is usually the first thing that I would teach if I were teaching a basic plasma course. Nonetheless, there's always a good point to begin. I'm glad I therefore am doing this. Uh, I, I had thought something like this may be the case. So the problem that I want to solve for you is the problem of what happens if you have a magnetic field, which I think you know the orbit motion there. It's purely cyclotron motion, right? The charged particle goes round, and if it has a parallel velocity, that moves parallel to the magnetic field, unchanged, because V cross B has no change to offer for V parallel motion. Vanishes, right? V is crossed with B. It's the perpendicular motion that is changed and gives you cyclotron orbits. Now, suppose you impose an electric field on top of it. If the electric field has a parallel component, it'll just accelerate the particle, right? Suppose if I take the parallel component of this equation, m dv t t, on the left-hand side, I have m d d t of v parallel. On the right-hand side, I have q e parallel. What about the second term, v cross b? What is its contribution? If I ask you a question like that, the answer is either one or zero can't be one, so it must be zero. V cross B has no component parallel to B, so that just drops out, right? 
So if you have a parallel component to, of E parallel to B, that will just accelerate the particle very simply along B. Not a complication, something you understand very well. So for simplicity, therefore, let me just say, assume the electric field is just perpendicular to B. What will it do to the particle? It turns out that actually you can show very simply, and I won't give you the derivation, that if you are looking at charged particle in prescribed electric and magnetic fields, and imagine you have a straight magnetic field and an electric field perpendicular to it, what will happen is that the electrons and ions are all going to drift with respect to, or move, drift, drift is a word for movement, with respect to this electric and magnetic field with a velocity VE, which is E cross B over B square. This is the well-known E cross B drift that you will hear about invoked all the time when you go to any conferences. It is the most fundamental drift that there is uh, in plasmas. Under this drift, the electrons and the ions, they move together. And this is what makes MHT possible. We are describing electro electrons and ions as an MHT fluid, right? And so you ask yourself, what makes them move together? The first thing that comes to you is the E cross B drift. And in fact, the MHT equation fluid velocity that binds electrons and ions together in the presence of electric and magnetic fields. Not all drifts do that, and I'll give you two examples of drifts where electrons and ions move differently. But this particular E cross B drift produces no charge separation. Electrons, ions, are moving together. You will not get the charge separation. the same way they have opposite charge, they cancel each other out. If you look at the motion that actually occurs, uh, notice that the spiraling motion of the electrons and ions are different. You go 
water speed drifts. And I'll tell you why I'm going to these drifts. Because when I get into kinetic theory, the single particle drift or the single particle motion will matter. You may have to code. cross grad B, this vanishes therefore, if there is no gradient to the magnetic field, by B squared, W perp is the perpendicular energy of the charged particles. And you have QB in the denominator. Notice the presence of Q in the denominator. Did the E cross B drift have a Q in it? No, because the independence of charge. This one does. What that means is, the protons and the electrons move Therefore, has the potential for sharp separation, creating challenges in the system. This is one drift. Another is this is by gradient to the magnetic field, but in these particular cases, the entire magnetic field was just pointing out of the plane of the board. They were not curved field lines, they were straight field lines. It just says that they were smaller on the right than on the left. And as you know, magnetic field lines. And that then leads to another class of shift. This is 
covered three of the drifts. There are a few more, but I just wanted to give you these. applications. Well, speaking of applications, I want to talk to you about the ring current in the Earth's magnetosphere. You know what that is? We got series in the Earth's magnetosphere and the perpendicular directly ring current goes around. And these can actually be understood on the basis of the uh, curvature drift and gradient B drift that we just talked about just now. And it turns out that if you are dealing with a vacuum field, you can use the property shown to be equal to zero to demonstrate that the gradient and the curvature drift just add up to infinity. It's a particular property of vacuum fields that make them that you can see if you understand. If you combine the two drifts, you can show that the electrons and ions are going around. And because they have opposite signs, notice that you're drifting around So that's an active area of inquiry. But this actually concludes my discussion of the simple drifts, uh, single particle drifts that we have. Now, I want to get into the 
Okay? So now you know what the distribution function in mu space is, or in 60 space is. question now is, we want to understand how f evolves in six-dimensional space labeled by r and v as a function of time. And I'm just going to give you the equation for this. And that's the, the first one is what is called the Blasov equation. are independent coordinates. On the right hand side you have zero and I want to explain what happens if you actually have collisions in the system. This equation, the one that is written below is the Boltzmann equation. It's one of the most beautiful equations in mathematical physics associated with the pioneering work of to you at least pictorially what the different physics of it is. 
bookkeeping on sorry on boss money. Let me not get ahead of myself. Let me get there slowly. Okay. So I wrote that Vlasov equation down. So del del T of n Very important. 
of the day, this is the story of a picote. Okay? 
So this is what you come to. Generally decreases, and Boltzmann proved rigorously that in the presence of collision, you have this property. The equality holds only when the system reaches an equilibrium. Time has to come to the equilibrium for a very, very long time, and you get the natural Boltzmann distribution of the area load at the wrong time to use it. Finish this right now. Yeah, so this is a good point. So here is this is the point I want to 
Okay. So I now want to uh, get into a, a new part of our study here, which is that we're going to look at the dynamics afforded by the Vlasov equation. And I want to introduce the idea of Landau damping to you. For simplicity, what we will do is to deal with a purely electrostatic plasma. So you have this equation for uh, this distribution function of species S. And I'm going to assume that there are no magnetic fields. And either when we start or during the evolution of the system, so that I can write for all times that curl E is 0, no del B del T. So if curl E is 0, then E is the gradient of a scalar, negative gradient in this case. So I replaced E by minus gradient of phi, as you've seen. But as we discussed, the requirement of self-consistency is that we must integrate Maxwell's equations. And in this case, where we are doing only electrostatics, the only Maxwell's equation that matters is uh, Coulomb's law. That's del dot E, which becomes minus del square phi, which is equal to the charge. And the charge is now integration. This gives you the number density multiplied by QS. So that gives you the charge density contribution and you sum over the species. Now you begin to see what I was saying to you earlier. What complicates life is the fact that you have to calculate E self-consistently from the FS information. So there is an iterative loop that is to be set up between these two equations. That's a fully nonlinear set of equations in the way in which they are, often referred to as integral differential equations. This is differential. This involves an integral. And this is a hard equation in general to solve. So what people tend to do is to solve the problem in the very beginning, uh, assuming that the amplitude of the wave is so small that we can linearize the equation and start the right there. So therefore, we write f, the total f, as a combination of the equilibrium f, which is Maxwellian. Plus a certain perturbation. Notice that the equilibrium itself satisfies the blast of equation. You put that into quickly. You can quickly check this and stop me if you don't. The Maxwellian has no time dependence. This term goes to zero. It has no R dependence. This term is uh, also zero, and it has no electric field in the beginning because Maxwellian by itself doesn't separate charge. So it's rigorously that, it can sustain charge, it can do, produce a perturbed distribution function, and this was the equilibrium. Think of that perturbed distribution function written as a plane wave solution with an amplitude exponential i k x minus omega t. Take this form and plug it into the linearized Vlasov equation. I call it linearized. 
and he actually found dampening. Uh, but missed a very important effect. When you do the problem the right way, and I'm just showing you things about computer, not because I want you to grab it bitterly, but because you're just straight out of the question. This L stands for a lambda of This changes. picture that I was, the equation that I was showing you before, it's a sign of the slope that is extremely important in determining whether you have growth or damping in this problem. And because of the slope being negative, with many more slower particles than there are faster particles, the wave is essentially damped. 
Landau damping essentially is. Are distribution functions always Maxwellian? No. I can, you know, I, I, So that's something to uh, keep in mind as you actually uh, move forward in this. I'm actually uh, going to, uh, sh sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. What I want to do is uh, talk to you about uh, the relationship some really drastic approximations. So I'm just going to try to give you a flavor of this. The continuity equation for an MG, let's just put the picture the things in 1D. So you start with this equation, simply integrate out the velocity curve altogether. So del del t of M D V plus del del x, this is V, F D V, taking the del del x out. A is the acceleration Let's look at the next equation, the momentum equation. 
Now, suppose if you don't have collisions at all, what do you do? You can actually show after a little bit of algorithm that those fluctuations can actually produce a right hand side for you for the average distribution function that looks like a collision. And I just want to give you only a corollary example of that. This is what is called the formula theory. It is often used as optimization in theory. What theory does is that it recognizes the results that there are some collisions. Questions?